This is section 47 of Mark Twain's Speeches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Rogers and Railroads by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman At a banquet given Mr. H. H. Rogers by the businessmen of Norfolk, Virginia, celebrating the opening of the Virginian Railway, April 3, 1909. Toastmaster, I have often thought that when the time comes, which must come to all of us, when we reach that great way in the great beyond, and the question is propounded, what have you done to gain admission into this great realm? If the answer could be sincerely made, I have made men laugh, it would be the surest passport to a welcome entrance. We have here tonight one who has made millions laugh, not the loud laughter that bespeaks the vacant mind, but the laugh of intelligent mirth that helps the human heart and the human mind. I refer, of course, to Dr. Clemens. I was going to say Mark Twain, his literary title, which is a household phrase in more homes than that of any other man, and you know him best by that dear old title. I thank you, Mr. Toastmaster, for the compliment which you have paid me, and I am sure I would rather have made people laugh than cry, yet in my time I have made some of them cry, and before I stop entirely I hope to make some more of them cry. I like compliments. I deal in them myself. I have listened with the greatest pleasure to the compliments which the chairman has paid to Mr. Rogers and that road of his tonight, and I hope some of them are deserved. It is no small distinction to a man like that to sit here before an intelligent crowd like this, and to be classed with Napoleon and Caesar. Why didn't he say that this was the proudest day of his life? Napoleon and Caesar are dead and they can't be here to defend themselves. But I'm here. The chairman said, and very truly, that the most lasting thing in the hands of man are the roads which Caesar built, and it is true that he built a lot of them, and they are there yet. Yes, Caesar built a lot of roads in England, and you can find them. But Rogers has only built one road, and he hasn't finished that yet. I like to hear my old friend complimented, but I don't like to hear it overdone. I didn't go around today with the others to see what he is doing. I will do that in a quiet time, when there is not anything going on, and when I shall not be called upon to deliver intemperate compliments on a railroad in which I own no stock." They proposed that I go along with the committee and help inspect that dump down yonder. I didn't go. I saw that dump. I saw that thing when I was coming in on the steamer, and I didn't go because I was diffident, sentimentally diffident, about going and looking at that thing again, that great, long, bony thing. It looked just like Mr. Rogers' foot. The chairman says Mr. Rogers is full of practical wisdom, and he is. It is intimated here that he is a very ingenious man, and he is a very competent financier. Maybe he is now, but it was not always so. I know lots of private things in his life which people don't know, and I know how he started, and it was not a very good start. I could have done better myself. The first time he crossed the Atlantic, he had just made the first little strike in oil, and he was so young he did not like to ask questions. He did not like to appear ignorant. To this day he doesn't like to appear ignorant, but he can look as ignorant as anybody. On board the ship they were betting on the run of the ship, betting a couple of shillings or half a crown, and they proposed that this youth from the oil regions should bet on the run of the ship. He did not like to ask what a half-crown was, and he didn't know, but rather than be ashamed of himself he did bet half a crown on the run of the ship, and in bed he could not sleep. He wondered if he could afford that outlay in case he lost. 
he kept wondering over it and said to himself a king's crown must be worth twenty thousand dollars so half a crown would cost ten thousand dollars he could not afford to bet away ten thousand dollars on the run of the ship so he went up to the stakeholder and gave him a hundred and fifty dollars to let him off i like to hear mr rogers complimented i am not stingy in compliments to him myself why i did it to-day when i sent his wife a telegram to comfort her that is the kind of person i am i knew she would be uneasy about him i knew she would be solicitous about what he might do down here so i did it to quiet her and to comfort her i said he was doing well for a person out of practice there is nothing like it he is like i used to be there were times when i was careless careless in my dress when i got older you know how uncomfortable your wife can get when you are going away without her superintendence once when my wife could not go with me she always went with me when she could i always did meet that kind of luck i was going to washington once a long time ago in mr cleveland's first administration and she could not go but in her anxiety that i should not desecrate the house she made preparation she knew that there was to be a reception of those authors at the white house at seven o'clock in the evening she said if i should tell you now what i want to ask of you you would forget it before you get to washington and therefore i have written it on a card and you will find it in your dress vest pocket when you are dressing at the arlington when you are dressing to see the president i never thought of it again until i was dressing and i felt in that pocket and took it out and it said in a kind of imploring way don't wear your arctics in the white house you complimented mr rogers on his energy his foresightedness complimented him in various ways and he has deserved those compliments although i say it myself and i enjoy them all there is one side of mr rogers that has not been mentioned if you will leave that to me i will touch upon that there was a note in an editorial in one of the norfolk papers this morning that touched upon that very thing that hidden side of mr rogers where it spoke of helen keller and her affection for mr rogers to whom she dedicated her life book and she has a right to feel that way because without the public knowing anything about it he rescued if i may use that term that marvelous girl that wonderful southern girl that girl who was stone deaf blind and dumb from scarlet fever when she was a baby eighteen months old and who now is as well and thoroughly educated as any woman on this planet at twenty-nine years of age she is the most marvelous person of her sex that has existed on this earth since joan of arc that is not all mr rogers has done but you never see that side of his character because it is never protruding but he lends a helping hand daily out of that generous heart of his you never hear of it he is supposed to be a moon which has one side dark and the other bright but the other side though you don't see it is not dark it is bright and its rays penetrate and others do see it who are not god i would take this opportunity to tell something that i have never been allowed to tell by mr rogers either by my mouth or in print and if i don't look at him i can tell it now in eighteen ninety three when the publishing company of charles l webster of which i was financial agent failed it left me heavily in debt if you will remember what commerce was at that time you will recall that you could not sell anything and could not buy anything and i was on my back my books were not worth anything at all and i could not give away my copyrights mr rogers had long enough vision ahead to say 
your books have supported you before and after the panic is over they will support you again and that was a correct proposition he saved my copyrights and saved me from financial ruin he it was who arranged with my creditors to allow me to roam the face of the earth for four years and persecute the nations thereof with lectures promising that at the end of four years i would pay dollar for dollar that arrangement was made otherwise i would now be living out of doors under an umbrella and a borrowed one at that you see his white mustache and his head trying to get white he is always trying to look like me i don't blame him for that these are only emblematic of his character and that is all i say without exception hair and all he is the whitest man i have ever known end of rogers and railroads by mark twain read by john greenman